Good morning. My name is Reverend Kate Wilkinson, and I'm so glad that you are here with us this morning, and I am honored to be sharing the pulpit with my fabulous worship committee. Each Sunday, we light our chalice as a symbol of our faith, and this morning, we invite Eric to light our chalice for us and share a few words about what this element of worship means. At the opening of our service, we light a flame inside a chalice. This flaming chalice has become a well-known symbol of the UU denomination. But where did it come from? Both chalices and fire have long been important religious symbols. The chalice, most famously for Christians, was used by Jesus at his last Passover Seder and became known as the Holy Grail. And flame has been a central symbol for many of the world's religions, including the candles of Hanukkah, eternal flames that stand watch at monuments and tombs, and the candles that flicker in cathedrals, temples, mosques, and meeting houses. In the UU tradition, the chalice and the flame were brought together as a Unitarian symbol by an Austrian artist, Hans Deutsch, during World War II. While living in Paris during the 1930s, Deutsch drew cartoons critical of Hitler. When the Nazis invaded Paris in 1940, he fled to Portugal. There he met the Reverend Charles Joy, executive director of the Unitarian Service Committee. The service committee had recently been founded in Boston to assist Eastern Europeans, among them Unitarians as well as Jews, who needed to escape Nazi persecution. From his Lisbon headquarters, Reverend Joy oversaw a secret network of couriers and agents. The service committee often needed to ask governments and other organizations for their help to save people who were in danger. They would send messages to any officials who might give them money, transportation, or a safe route. Hans Deutsch was impressed and soon was working for the service committee. He later wrote to Reverend Joy, there is something that urges me to tell you how much I admire your utter self-denial and readiness to serve, to sacrifice all, your time, your health, your well-being, to help. I am not what you may actually call a believer, but if your kind of life is the profession of your faith, as it is, I feel sure, then religion, ceasing to be magic and mysticism, becomes a confession to active, really useful social work. And this religion, with or without a heading, is one to which even a godless fellow like myself can say wholeheartedly, yes. Reverend Joy asked Hans Deutsch to create a symbol for their papers. He wanted a symbol that would impress governments and other organizations who had the power to help move people to safety and at the same time to symbolize the spirit of their work. The symbol that Deutsch created was, as Reverend Joy wrote to the service committee board in Boston, quote, a chalice with a flame, the kind of chalice which the Greeks and Romans put on their altars. The holy oil burning in it is a symbol of helpfulness and sacrifice. This was in the mind of the artist. The fact, however, that it remotely suggests a cross was not in his mind. But to me, this also has its merit. We do not limit our work to Christians. Indeed, at the present moment, our work is nine-tenths for Jews. Yet we do stem from the Christian tradition, and the cross does symbolize Christianity and its central theme of sacrificial love. And just for those who don't know what we're talking about, this is, I'm sure most of you know it, but this is the symbol that he created. And I never really noticed the cross element of it myself until I researched this. But. The flaming chalice design was made into a seal for papers and a badge for agents moving refugees to freedom. The story of Hans Deutsch reminds us that the symbol of a flaming chalice for you use first signifies a life of service. When Deutsch designed the flaming chalice, he had never seen a Unitarian or Universalist um, church or heard a sermon. But what he had seen was the service committee, with the service committee was faith in action, people who were willing to risk all for others in a time of need. Many years later, the flaming chalice became the symbol of Unitarian Universalist groups all over the world. By the early 1970s, enough UUs had heard the story of the flaming chalice symbol that they began to light a flaming chalice as part of their worship service. 
Over the years, this practice has spread to most of the United States and Canada. The chalice symbol is often shown surrounded by two linked rings, which I think you saw, signifying the joining of Unitarianism and Universalism. Today, it is the official symbol of the UU Service Committee, which is still in existence, and the UU Association itself. Officially or unofficially, it functions as a logo for hundreds of congregations. Perhaps most importantly, it has become a focal point for worship. No one meaning or interpretation is official. The flaming chalice, like our faith, stands open to receive new truths and has many different interpretations, including the light of reason, the warmth of community, and the flame of hope. Thank you, Eric. Uh, before we sing our first hymn of the day, let's talk about hymn singing. Some of you are like, oh, this is my least favorite part of the service because I just have to stand and feel awkward while people around me sing. And when I look, I, I usually sit in the back with my husband James back there and I look around and I see a lot of people not to, uh, opening their mouths either. So I want to try something. Look at hymn 360 in your gray hymnal. This, by the way, is the hymnal that we've used for many years. I forget what year it was instituted, 1984. We also have the teal hymn books, which are more brightly colored. And the teal hymn books came out within the last uh, five or six years. And the Teal Hymn Book has much more um, modern music. We're gonna sing a hymn from, from the Teal Book at the end of the service, and you will immediately see the difference. The music is uh, much more contemporary. The worship committee believes that the candles of joys and concerns are a valuable, deeply spiritual and commu community building segment of our service. And yet, on occasion, it can create some stumbling blocks for us. This is problematic in that we try to hold our services to one hour, respecting that many must rush off to work, to family, or even to the beach for visitors. Many churches have done away with this segment for a multitude of reasons. While we at the Meeting House have wrestled with the problems of joys and concerns, we have steadfastly kept it as a part of our Sunday service because we know its inherent worth. Each candle lit alerts us to friends in joy, pain, or worry. The candles lit in silence are held by the energy in this room, which connects us all. The value of sitting, listening, praying, and being with a person in their time of grief or joy is immeasurable. As a culture, we are taught to try and fix things when they go askew. Joys and Concerns teaches us that sometimes just witnessing a person's pain in silence and community is what helps the most. The worship committee sees this as a very sacred time in our service. As such, we are always wondering how to assert certain ground rules. We are always looking for ways to keep joys and concerns as a, worship, as a worshipful time and not a time to make announcements or to divert into graphic medical detail or personal data that might be better for all if left private. And of course, we always ask for your help in this. Our goal is to always respect the unguarded reverence of every candle that is lit. We will continue with joys and concerns as a part of our worship, valuing it as a time of prayer and spiritual communion, during which we honor one another just by our mere presence and tender hearts. This next part of our service, um, prayer and meditation, I was asked to speak to. And um, we acknowledge that prayer is different for everyone and that prayer is sacred. 
some of us have carried with us from different traditions and cultural backgrounds our earliest experiences with prayer. From childhoods, the prayers we learn to recite may well be, um, may be those we know best by heart and the ones we reach to in times of needed comfort, strength, or rest. While for others, these learned prayers may have betrayed them or weighed them down with dogma. Many of us have made our own prayers, some in the silence where words drift like leaves from branches. For some, prayers are poems, the wise words of friends and teachers, memories of loving, um, of loving marked, marking the pages of books with pressed flowers, violets, saved letters. Rev Kate will often also select prayers um, from writers and enlightened thinkers and world events to guide us into contemplation. We have a book um, of prayers and quotations uh, of inspiration. And um, in the back of our hymnal are some really very rich and wonderful um, quotations as well that we refer to. Prayer can be anything from whispers to cries to forgiveness asked and given. Prayers can, be, can run the wilderness of our evolving human spirit. Prayers can be the needle darning together the threads of petition and promise in our lives with new levels of consciousness, wonder, purpose, and being. In our silent prayer and meditation, we become the breath that sustains and connects us to this world and the eternal world beside us. In these moments, we may find renewal, inspiration. We may be awakened to the elements which quench our thirst, warm our days, and reveal to us the inner workings of our very different natures. We might find that here, in this silence, this refuge, that we are unaware of our needs, yet assured that they are known and tended to. We let go. The Buddha bell, which is our bell here that I'm not going to ring now, but I will be ringing that. The first of our senses to develop uh, is our hearing. And while this is a physical hearing, it is, I feel, not necessary to literally hear. I think of sound and breath as connected. The first breath we take as we come into the world is joined by our first declaration of our arrival. That first cry that brings an inexpressible joy to new parents uh, is also the first sound we hear, the sound of our own being. Bells have long broken the silence, joined the sacred moments of ritual as the cock crows at morning we awaken to bells. We rest from work and toil. We are alerted by them, called to community and to inner communion by them. National Geographic has published not long ago a scientific finding, um, findings that the, um, the formation of stones at Stonehenge are actually a circle of ancient bells. 200 miles to their location, they were moved and, and cut to be sounded um, as bells. Each of the stones resonates a specific frequency and they're now being studied at the places where the scarring and wear marks, uh, where mark the strikings of, those, of, the, of the rocks. We use our Buddha bell in reverence and reference 
to the sacred ancient practice of calling oneself to outer and inner attention. After our spoken word, our spoken prayer, and a few moments of silence, we will sing together Spirit of Life, which is printed in your order of service. May each prayer I enter, may each prayer I enter be a doorway into greater knowing or unknowing, such as the case may be. Let my prayer be both one of request and bequest, and one which can travel the distance from one heart to another. The living tradition we share draws from many sources, direct experience of transcending mystery and wonder, words and deeds of prophetic women and men, wisdom from the world's religions, Jewish and Christian teachings, humanist teachings that lift up reason and science, spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions celebrating the sacred circle of life. We draw from all of these traditions in our worship and our readings that we use come from all of these sources as well. In the Christian tradition, each church uses the same biblical passages each week, drawn from what is called the lectionary. In Unitarian Universalist congregations, each minister or guest speaker selects their own sacred text. Readings may come from the Bible, but they may also come from an ancient folk tale, a piece of poetry, or even a newspaper article. What makes the reading sacred is not its origin, but the attention and study and spirit we bring to it. We include a reading in our worship to support the general theme of service, and sometimes the reading is echoed in the sermon. This morning's reading is by Reverend Sue Phillips. Sue writes, I lost my mind two days into my ministerial internship. We had a staff retreat at the minister's house. The office staff was there, our musician, the director of religious education, and the ministers. We spent the day getting to know one another better, sharing personal stories and planning for the new church year. When it came time to close the retreat, one of the ministers asked me to extinguish the candle, which had been burning quietly all day in a beautiful ceramic chalice. I got up thinking that I would put the candle out with my wet fingers. As I got close to the candle, I realized that the flame was much too large and that I would seriously burn my fingers if I put it out like that. And then it happened. I forgot how to extinguish a candle. I simply could not figure out how to do it. I stood there, completely still, hunched over the flame for at least five full seconds. Time also stood still as the staff considered the utter lack of intelligence exhibited by the new intern. And the intern considered the possibility that she had had a stroke. <laughs> Finally, I said, how should I do this? And the minister replied, um, you could blow it out. <laughs> so I did. I was mortified, and my humiliation did not end that day. The staff gave me grief about it all year. I got a candle snuffer for the staff holiday party. I didn't realize at the time that this incident would come to define my experience, not only as a minister, but as a spiritual seeker. Forgetting how to blow out that candle was a spiritual lesson. It has to do with becoming a beginner again and with giving up hard-won claims to expertise. It has to do with asking for help and getting it. 
It has to do with cultivating what Buddhists call beginner's mind. Beginner's mind approaches everything as if for the first time. It is the mind that is innocent of preconceptions and expectations, judgments and prejudices. Beginner's mind is simply present to experience and sees things as they are. Beginner's mind faces life as a small child, full of curiosity and wonder and amazement, and it's unattached to knowing anything in particular. Nothingness can be your dear spiritual friend, Sue reminds us, your greatest spiritual asset. Spiritual wisdom doesn't have to be alchemized. It doesn't come from mysterious ingredients, and it isn't forged in fire. You don't have to try hard to find it. The source of replenishment is already at hand. Beginner's mind is yours already. All you have to do is nothing at all. <laughs>